At this time, it is my privilege to introduce the Lieutenant Governor of Vermont, um, David Zuckerman. If you would join us here on the stage. Thank you so much. Thank so you. good to meet you. Thank Absolutely. you for being here. Now you have an option. There are microphones. Oh it's too hard. I, can I just talk like this? Well, we're recording, so I have to. Yeah. Then I'll whisper so you get the recording. Otherwise, I talk really loud. Um, I'm David Zuckerman, Lieutenant Governor. And you're right. Once the lights are on you, you can't see anything out there. Uh, I'm also an organic vegetable farmer uh, for about 30 years, 25 years with my own farm with my spouse. Thank you. Um, and I've been up since five because we had farmer's market. It was phenomenal. The rain stopped. Everybody came. I don't know what happened here, but the sun shined all day on us today. Um, none of that's true. Uh, but, uh, and we didn't, well, I guess rain was okay now, but we really haven't needed much rain this year. Um, and I, I just want to briefly say that I was at the uh, uh, Renewable Energy Vermont conference a couple days ago. And I was reminding that crowd, which nobody really needs reminders for the most part, but we, we've been thinking a lot about the flooding, of course, this year and the horrific impact on many of our communities and downtowns, but also many, many farm fields. Uh, my farm did not get flooded, but many of the farms that didn't get flooded also sort of died by a thousand drops of rain. I mean, the diseases, the nutrient leaching from the soil. Uh, I'm selling squash that should be lasting till January or February, and they're rotting in my bins because they just sat on wet ground so long that uh, they never really developed the shell they needed, and various bacteria have gotten into them. So the impacts are, are just huge from what's going on with the climate. And with this crowd, I remind them, you might all remember the flood, but do you remember that in mid-May, we didn't just have a frost, we had a deep, deep freeze that killed most of the stone fruits, the apples and everything else. 20 odd degrees where I was, 22 degrees, when normally we just get kisses of frost, if we even get them in May anymore. And then two weeks later, we had the hottest day of the summer, it was 94 degrees, and it was dry. And so a number of us were doing rain dances, so you can blame us for then what happened. And then we had this rain that wouldn't stop, the flooding, and it's sort of one thing after another, and we still haven't had a frost, right? And so that's the context that we are thinking about regenerative agriculture, food production, climate. What can we do in agriculture to try our best to mitigate our societies and our world's impact on our climate, but also to help amplify the consequences the food consequences are huge. Um, now, this year we, we shrunk to half our size on our farm because we couldn't find the help we needed. Uh, but we normally go into the fall about this time of year with peak food and storage of about 140,000 pounds of food, maybe 120,000 pounds of food. And this year we probably have 15 or 20,000 pounds. So we cut our production in half but then even beyond that, so maybe we should have had 70,000 pounds. We're a mediumly large farm. I'm not like Paul Harlow or the Mazas farm or some of those scale vegetable and, and um, produce and, and meat farms, but um, our food system, I'm gonna give you one other piece, back to when the pandemic started, that March we had about 20,000 pounds of carrots and a few other things in our coolers. Those three weeks when the pandemic started, that food which we would normally have sold two or 3,000 pounds a week, another you know, eight, 10 weeks of sales, we sold in like three weeks. Because the shelves, if you all remember, besides toilet paper, other things were also, supply chains were breaking down and so forth. And so when we think about the climate and we think about our own community here in Vermont, uh, the amount of food that I used to normally have this time of year, while it sounded like a lot, say 120,000 pounds, I live in Chittenden County, that's three quarters of a pound of food for every resident of Chittenden County for one day. So we need to be thinking about what is our true food resilience as far as our systems here in Vermont. And my CSA that year went through the roof as far as subscriptions. And I was trying to remind people that the only reason the farm was there is because of the people that had been members the year before. And if you only try to be a member of a local farm or buy locally when the food supply comes up short, then you haven't really done what you need to do to have a consistent food supply by buying that local food when food isn't coming up short. 
And if you support those farms that are growing local food, and those in particular that are doing regenerative, or I tend to lean towards more the organic regenerative side of the equation, um, then you're also not yet supporting a food system that's actually gonna help us have a future for our kids and grandkids. And when I was at that renewable energy conference on Thursday, I had five minutes to speak along with a couple other statewide office holders. And I started with the past weather of this season. And you can go back to the ski season and it wasn't particularly good either. Um, and, but I concluded talking about renewable energy, talking about regenerative agriculture. I mean, the reality is we know what we need to do. We know what we can do if we apply ourselves, both from public policy, which I guess is one hat that I wear, and in agriculture and food and in our consumptive habits. And we're, th there, there's all kinds of engineering and ideas to do all kinds of things to pull carbon out of the air. The technology's there, it's been there for thousands of years. Plants do it every single day. And if we incorporate, and I'm using that word on purpose, plants into this conversation and this equation and cover cropping and really building soil, which is the foundation of organic agriculture. Building soil is adding organic matter. Organic matter by definition is carbon for those that don't know that. that we can do that in food production. We can sequester carbon. I mean, as you know from the prior movie to the movie that's gonna be shown here with Kiss the Ground, the satellite imagery of the carbon release when soil is worked up all over this country and around the world in the major grain baskets, it is releasing carbon like nobody's business. But if you are planting your crops in a way to sequester that carbon, we can reverse that. Uh, and it's much harder to not turn your soil as an organic grower. We cultivate a lot to kill weeds because we don't use the chemicals. But it is a more holistic methodology when you're not poisoning the water and poisoning the soil in order to do regenerative agriculture, which much of the regenerative agriculture in our country is. But I'll tell you one last positive thing, even about that kind of agriculture. I got a phone call from a very large farm in Vermont, 2,000 odd cows, and we've had a relationship because I've been involved in Farm Bureau for 25 years, and I've been involved in agricultural policy for 25 years. And they called and they said, hey, we've been studying our soil for NPK, because we're a large farm, we have to get a permit, we gotta do all these testing and soil nutrient management because of the water, we're all well aware of those issues. And she said, you know, we hadn't been looking at one of the other results, which is that in the last 10 years, because they'd gone to no-till, which included cover crops and then glyphosate to kill them down with the GMO corn, but they had increased their organic matter in 10 years by 1%. Now, who here is a farmer or understands the incredible reality of increasing your organic matter by 1% in 10 years. And so then I sit there and go, ugh, moral conflict, because their farming has been pulling carbon out of the air like nobody's business for the last 10 years, um, as has mine, but not at that rate. Uh, and so it's complicated. But all of it comes down to what we eat, what we choose to eat, how we choose to consume and walk and travel on this earth. And when I finished at Renewable Energy a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, um, I said, you know, I have a 17, almost 18 year old daughter. Anybody here have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews that are teenagers or zero to tens or twenties, you know? What are we doing? <laughs> right? I mean, we keep saying it's the responsibility of the next generation. Is there anybody that can't handle the word bullshit? <laughs> right? It is all of our responsibility. And if we don't all adjust what we are doing in our day-to-day -day lives, in our consumptive habits, and make choices that then support farmers that are making food, one of the most basic things we need to survive, um, then what are we doing? And we don't have a lot of time to mess around. Uh, anybody see the New York Times article a few days back that showed the changing temperature through the year of the 12 months with this line that was going across the screen and slowly going higher and higher? And 
in these last couple of decades, the space between the gaps as month by month, year over year, we are on average going up in a very frighteningly fast way. We're seeing it in our lifetimes. So when I think about my 18-year-old or nearly 18-year-old daughter, um, and again, it was a renewable energy conference, but I said, I'll take a wind turbine. What is beauty? You know, we look at the beautiful landscape we have here in Vermont, but we produce most of our power out of state. And we export the cost of that power on other people. And when I see a wind turbine or a solar field, and I'm okay with it on some of the marginal soils because our energy system is also a key piece of this. We need to both put less carbon up and we need to be pulling as much carbon down. How do we define beauty is a critical piece of whether we're gonna have a future. And so um, I'm really excited to see the film. I'm really excited about what's been going on today with this whole uh, sort of day of different activities and movies and some dancing that I missed. I'm sorry about that, I love contra dancing. Um, and I just hope that, I mean, obviously a lot of you are the choir, um, but we need to be singing loudly and bring far more people into the choir uh, so that we have food and preferably fewer floods and fewer deep freezes in mid-May and more winter for snow and to keep our maple trees alive. Uh, you know, we're, we're not gonna have these maple trees in 40 or 50 years at the rate we're going. Um, so I'm heartened to see you all here. Uh, I believe I'm supposed to uh, be introducing Jesse. Is Jesse here? Hi. How are you? Good. Um, good to see you again as well. So uh, Jesse Bouchak is um, going to be uh, performing for us, and uh, that's about what I know you're going to do. So I'm not going to take any longer to do it. Oh, oh, one more thing. Okay, thing. Um, I actually just well, first of all, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sure, it's wonderful. Absolutely. Oh no, you you had a little. Accident. She's pointing out maybe you noticed, but one side of my face looks a little different than the other side of my face. Um, I've got quite a bit of a shiner on the right side. Uh, on Sunday, I was rolling up my high tunnel, and I was looking to see how high it was rolled up, and the bar um, didn't set to the ground, and it swung back up and over. Anybody know high tunnels and greenhouses? And it cracked me across the top of the head. Um, I don't have a concussion, so I have a thick skull. It's good, good news. Um, but over the next, like, four days, the, the fluids came down and it made me look like a raccoon, just in time for Halloween. Anyway, thank you. It looks tough. Yeah. Looks tough. I have a newsletter as lieutenant governor. If anybody wants to sign up for it, you won't get political fundraising. This is my official newsletter. Uh, if you want to sign up, please feel free. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to jump on real quick to just personally also thank Jesse for making the trip down here from Burlington or Chittenden County. Yeah. Oh, over in New York now, okay, wow, even further. Um, and that we had reached out to Jesse for a number of different things, but including for his um, knowledge and, and advocacy uh, to help uh, resurrect and propagate the Abenaki language. And so I wanted to just encourage, if you wouldn't mind, um, be as part of this, if you weren't already planning, to share with the group a bit about what you're doing with that and how language uh, might connect to um, a restoration of, of knowledge that um, for many of us is new, but for many others is not at all new. It's um, uh, all interconnected, and I think that's one of the themes of today. Um, so take it away, and thank you for being here, Jesse. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share a little bit with you. It's great to hear from Lieutenant Governor uh, David Zuckerman and uh, so many others so far today. And there are other voices that we haven't heard from yet, and I can't really speak uh, for uh, all of those voices, but I'll try to sing a little bit for um, our indigenous people of this place. And there are many songs and there are many stories that still exist, and the language certainly still exists and is still spoken. I am the director of the School of Abenaki at Middlebury College. I'm very proud to be there. In Nami Hon Ki Ani Dali Atianis Tanikaton Hon Zin. Oligan, Oligan. Nulida Hon Zin Nami Olan, Nami Olak. 
It's great to see you. And there are some speakers here of our language, um, some Nano Alda geeks, some keepers. Uh, we are, our language numbers are growing again thanks to the commitment from Middlebury and a long commitment here with Dartmouth College. I was here at St. Paul's many years as well as at Dartmouth offering language immersions for over a decade. It's great to be back. Thank you for this opportunity. I won't, again, try to, try to sing a few things for you and I'll certainly use the language. It's a wonderful vehicle and music is a wonder, wonderful vehicle to help us recognize that language itself is song. Uh, there is a melody, there is a rhythm to each language, and the rhythm of a Benaki is one, or Abenaki. As we'd say in the language, that's a rhythm right there, rhythm and melody. It's a three, two, one sound, a Benaki, a Benaki, as we're speaking in the language. People of the land. So I have something to say. The people of the land we call home today. And we're still here. I'd like to just share something that comes from um, our tradition, a uh, traditional story about, we heard about the trees, the ash trees in great danger now. Obviously, it's, it's, it's predicted to be lost to the ash borer beetle. We come from the ash tree as a Beneke people, and our creation story says that long ago, the very first people were not made of ash. They were not made of something that was green and growing and deeply rooted to the earth. They were made of stone to be strong, to withstand all the troubles, the hardships of winter. Um, but those stone people didn't take care of the earth, and we can learn from that. A good story is memorable, and it has a good lesson, and I'd like to just sing a little bit about that and about our connection. As human beings, we are all Almon Bach. <sighs> Like the ash we are Green and growing hearts Will bend But we won't fall Will bend But we won't fall At first the people were made of stone But they destroyed everyone And everything as they would roam so they were crushed to bones. We see litter in the ground in the land that we call home. We see litter in the ground in the land that we call home. Reminding us not to live like them, or we'll be litter in our home with the bones of the stones. We'll be litter in our home with the bones of the stones. Deeply like the ash we are Green and growing hearts will bend but we won't fall will bend but we won't fall First the people were made of stone but they destroyed everyone and everything as they would roam so they were crushed into stone we see litter in the land of litter in the ground of the land that we call home. We see litter in the ground of the land that we call home. Reminding us not to live like them, or we'll be litter in our home with the bones of the stones. We'll be litter in our home with the bones of the stones. We'll be litter in our home with the bones. First time I've ever played that song, just been working on it this week, but it's not a new story, it's an ancient story. It's a story of how we came to be um, shaped by one we call Gluskomba from the ash tree we stepped forward. Um, we're coming into a time we call Pabun, uh, a time of starvation, of always eating or winter, and we heard a bit about um, food security, and we need to really consider the effects we've been having on the earth and those effects are also ones that we've been having on one another. When we reconnect with each other, we reconnect with the earth, we all get stronger. And in that song, we hear about a disconnection from those stone people. We say they were crushed into stones, which we see all over the land now. We don't want to join those stones. We also don't want to become disconnected from one another. 
when we do, we destroy each other. And this is a song a bit about that. We talk about a character in the Algonquian tradition, and Western Abenaki is an Eastern Algonquian language. Within it, we have, a, um, we have culture heroes. We also have monsters. And kids, kids love monster stories. This is about Halloween. This is about that time to tell some of those scary stories. And one of the scariest is one that comes out real soon. We'll have that first frost soon enough. And we name this one uh, to the west of us among the Anishinaabwan languages, the Windigo. It's known to the east of us among the Mi'kmaq, or as has been wrongfully named the Mi'kmaq people in English, uh, the Chinu. We call this one Kiwa, literally means the one who wanders the forest aimlessly. Kiwa walks among us, heart frozen by despair, lashing out at others themselves will not repair. He walk, walks among us, devouring our own. There's no weapon that can stop their wandering the woods alone. There's no weapon that can stop by love and gentle hair. The heart it seems stronger than the cold this winter's air. He walk, walks among us, once called family. Now we fear to see them. Walk, walks among us, evening the score. They grow with every victim, but their hunger grows even more. But their hunger grows even more. One was defeated by love and gentle care. The heart, it seems, is stronger than the coldest winter's air, than the coldest winter's air. Kitalami Kulbak at Silenium Zibioani. Thank you so much. We come together. Uh, when we come together with one another and we come together with the earth, we find peace and we are certainly living in a time where a cry for peace is so important. And to um, look at this idea of a war cry, which we've heard often in relation to indigenous people, sadly. I, I wrote a song called Peace Cry and I think we all need it today uh, around the world, uh, thinking about all those who need peace and we certainly need it right here in our home uh, in Indakina as well. And this is a song for peace, and I do quote in it Mahatma Gandhi's idea of uh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So peace cry. I also use the language quite a bit in this, and I was asked to mention one of the most important ways uh, that I use to teach language is by singing it. And I'll sing a few times in this, this idea of may peace prevail on earth forever a phrase that I've translated for peace polls, dozens of them across New England. It's wonderful to see them going up, but it's also even better to be able to read the languages that they're written in, so I will sing exactly what's written, May Peace Prevail on Earth, several times to begin this song. La kamiga no kada uskit kamigwa as kamiwi. May peace prevail on earth forever. La kamiga no kada uskit kamigwa as kamiwi. May peace prevail on earth forever. La kamiga no kada uskit kamigwa as kamiwi. Can you hear the cry? Can you hear the cry? Peace cry, the 
whole world is blind when it's eye for an eye. Peace cry. When you plant in the seeds of reconstruction, take stepping off the road of destruction, reconnecting the hoop, welcoming all inside, welcoming all inside. Strong enough to make up and put our hate aside. Peace cry. The whole world is blind when it's eye for an eye. Peace cry. We've got nowhere to go, no separation. We all share the same home. Time to renew relations. Reconnecting the hoop, welcoming all inside. Welcoming all inside. Are we brave enough to wake up and let our fear subside? Peace cry. The whole world is blind when it's eye for an eye. Make peace prevail on earth forever. Make peace prevail on earth forever. Can you hear the cry? Can you hear the cry? Peace cry. The whole world is blind when it's eye for an eye. Peace cry. Peace cry. In order to simply survive, um, we have, our voices have not been heard and our, our faces have not been seen here on this landscape for a long time, but we've certainly been here. And it's, uh, I'm, again, I'm only speaking for myself, but it's with a great deal of pride that I share a song about our people and about our hidden, in many cases, ancestry. And I put this together in response to so many and so many important questions as we all come into relation to one another uh, it's called Hidden Roots. Our own Banaki roots may be hidden, but this we already know. It's from hidden roots that we grow. Kongara kwikok adud zigiak. When Bedell fell underground, we had to go to Oswino. Some found shelter in winter's land, some remain in family bands. Kongara, we go. Adud Zigia Konda Sibu Quia Eo Ambanaki roots may be hidden, but this we already know. It's from hidden roots that we grow. Konda Dam. Deeply rooted to this land, Konda Sibu, 
Rising up hand in hand con da sibo Strong enough to withstand the blows Con da sibo Que a mio Bibi tan wazan em paz gwen mi nalin thong gan kion zi kan wa kion nda ke kizi um kluzi on almon bon do on gan ni wazi um idama an hada mawi i just have one more song and most of you can't understand what i just said but that's all i said and i would really love it if you would linto wa wi if you would sing with me on this song linto wa wi We've got to find a way. This film offers us many ways. What we heard from the governor and from others today offer us, us ways. And I sing um, in a traditional way, the words away. And I'd love for you to join me in that part. We're looking for a way um, and singing a little bit about that in this final song and really looking forward to the rest of our evening together. Again, Kitsi Leoni, thank you for listening to these songs and thank you for being a part of this movement for all of us and for this place. It is this earth that connects us to one another and we must be connected to this place to find that connection again. So let's find a way. Away, 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 away. I'm thanking my mother and thanking my father today. But all that they've given us has slowly been taken away. Our mother's beneath some and our father's above blackened skies. While the rivers flow with her blood, the rain is the tears that he cries. Away, 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 away. While so much is changing, what matters still remains. Hold on to your stories, remember the places and names. Now our people are fighting, we're struggling just to survive. But the battle that must be won is keeping our planet alive. Cause we're just like you. nothing we can do till we come together away yeah away it's away much damage but there's still so much beauty to see just open your eyes and a part of it you can still be creation is all we are and no one can take that away but our future depends on what we do today cause I'm just like you we're people between earth and sky and there's nothing we can do till we come together away
Good to see you, Randy. Thank you. Thank you so much, and enjoy the Kinamoto Lovat. Enjoy the movie.